Hello wrestling fans it's the Pro Wrestle Machine. In this video, we are going over DDP Diamond Dallas Page from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. July 8, 2002. The career of Diamond Dallas Page, which is now officially over due to decisions made by his insurance company and WWE management, is one of the most intriguing careers of this era to look at. His success and failure points to more having the right and wrong friends, people being closed-minded about styles and timing than anything else. But above all, it has to be considered a success, not because of his three world title reigns, which truthfully only underscored in all instances just how screwed up the company was in regard to positioning of the belt, but because he turned into a very good worker, even though many will disagree with that statement, but his quality matches seemed to prove it, while starting very late. In his first few years, most thought of him in the ring as a guy who wasn't very good, and was too old to be breaking in, who kept the position because he was friends with Eric Bischoff. And it was ironic that in his last year, it was the opposite. He was viewed as a bad worker, even when he wasn't, because he wrestled differently, and his being buried in WWE underscored all the problems in the company when it came to absorption of WCW and missing almost all the potential business that should have brought. The real straw that broke the camel's back on his career was when Lloyds of London informed him that if he wrestled again, they were going to terminate his insurance policy. Vince McMahon and Jim Ross also told him they felt he should retire. He saw a spinal specialist in Birmingham who sent the WWE a letter recommending he no longer wrestle due to his neck problems, which is where McMahon and Ross came to the agreement to recommend him not attempting a comeback. He's going to stay with the company in a capacity yet to be determined, at least throughout his contract, which has two years remaining. He's been considered for an announcing gig, which would make it go full circle since his first major league role in WCW was as an announcer. He'd also like to work in public relations. Although just about every specialist but one had recommended he retire, Page who turned 46 just days before his last match, real name Paige Falkenberg, was still going to give it a try. Dr. Lloyd Youngblood, who is considered the WWE's guru when it comes to neck problems because of his success in Steve Austin having a full recovery, had taught him he could wrestle as long as he could handle the pain, at which point he would need surgery that would end his career. Born April 5, 1956, he grew up in Point Pleasant, New Jersey, a photo of him on the back of his autobiography, Positively Page, shows a kid looking similar to Alfred E. Newman of Mad Magazine fame. But he was a good high school athlete, earning second-team All-Ocean County honors in basketball in 1974. He got some college offers, and briefly attended Coastal Carolina College, but didn't even last until the start of basketball season before getting sick and quitting school. Actually Page started wrestling very briefly after college, using the ring name Handsome Dallas Page, working for Canadian promoter George Crybaby Cannon. Dallas became from his childhood love of the Dallas Cowboys. After maybe a half dozen matches, his knee was banged up, and his career seemingly was over. He spent more than a decade roaming from nightclub to nightclub, working as a manager, in a scene somewhat reminiscent of pro-wrestling old-time territorial wars. He learned all the dirty tricks of the trade. He did well enough financially in that business that when the AWA was dying, and in need of a manager to replace Paul E. Dangerously, Paul Heyman, who quit after a falling out with Vern Gagne. Gagne liked Page, maybe not because they thought he was a good manager, because actually, at nearly six foot five, they thought he was way too big to be a manager, but because he was willing to fly himself to the TV tapings, with several girls dubbed Diamond Dolls, giving their show some needed sex appeal, and work cheap. His height was even more noticeable since he was managing Paul Diamond and Pat Tanaka, in particular Tanaka, who was only 5-7 to seven when he was wearing lifts. Breaking the cardinal rule about managers not being bigger than the wrestler just had to be since times were tough at this point in the AWA. He got national exposure on ESPN and there was no denying he had a strong rap. When Dusty Rhodes opened up a territory in Florida, which was Page's home base since his real job was running Norma Jean's nightclub in Fort Myers, he became both the lead hill manager and color commentator. He got to work programs opposite Rhodes, usually managing Fred Ottman, Typhoon, Tugboat, Shockmaster, and the big bad Steel Man and worked alongside Gordon Soley in hosting the show. Even though he was working two territories, wrestling was still more of an ego-driven sidelight. When both the AWA and Florida went down, he was on the verge of quitting wrestling. He talked with a lot of friends and others about whether or not he had any potential to go farther. The general feeling was he had two things going for him, a gift of gab, and a natural ability to portray a scumbag that people would hate. Many of the biggest names in the industry advised him not to give up, because he had potential as a manager. 
it's doubtful people would have given him the same advice if they were being honest, when he asked them about, at his age, starting from scratch and being a pro wrestler. When Rhodes was hired as WCW Booker, his questions were answered. He was in a major organization and actually made money working in wrestling for the first time. They did a gimmick where the fabulous Freebirds, by this time Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin, had two managers, Page and Big Daddy Dink, famous 70s and 80s manager Sir Oliver Humperdinck. This was hardly the Freebirds of a decade earlier, who were a revolutionary force in the industry. By this point they were largely a great ring entrance to Hayes' music. Once the bell rang, they were having a hard time keeping up with the newer and younger talent, even though they did have more charisma than most. Page later expanded to announcing some of the company's B-shows. He also started training to wrestle. He had the size and had always wanted to do it. While managing the Diamond Stud, Scott Hall and his pre-Razor Ramon gimmick, he started regular attending the power plant as the oldest student, and the only one who was regularly on television, at the age of 35. He would end up being one of the best in-ring performers the school would produce which says both a lot about him, and also about the lack of success of the school in producing stars. About the same time, he married his current wife and future wrestling performer and founder of the Nitro Girls, Kimberly Bacon. With the exception of Bad News Allen who is an Olympic medalist in judo, nobody had, at least over the past 20 years, become a major wrestling star while starting their career so late. In regards to Allen, the circumstances were totally different. New Japan wanted Allen to succeed because of his look and his legit credentials. And he was a legit tough guy, which they liked, plus there were few in wrestling at the time with his level of athletic ability. Page was a guy who was nothing past being a good high school basketball player, who had a good rap, was a big guy, but little else. He persevered, and became a full-time mid-card wrestler, occasionally teaming with Hall, and later with Kevin Nash, who at the time went by the name Vinny Vegas, as the Vegas connection. It worked steadily improved, but he was strictly mid-card, and virtually never appeared on pay-per-view shows. Few of the wrestlers respected Page early except those who trained with him at the power plant. He was older than most, but still on the green side. He looked older than he was because of all his years in the sun and working the bar life, combined with having a natural pale complexion. It was considered comedy in the dressing room when a 50-year-old man was able to con people into investment schemes and a story that made national news by telling people he was the famous wrestler Diamond Dallas Page during his WCW glory days. He was always hooked up to ice packs, or taped up to where he was jokingly called a mummy. He tore his rotator cuff at 36, which many felt was just the sign he was too old to be starting out. But after surgery and six months off, he recovered and got even better. Eventually there was grudging respect for him because he did work hard. He was one of the few wrestlers who after achieving stardom, was a regular at the power plant because he was striving to improve and having the best matches he possibly could. He grew to have good matches, although many of the veterans resented that he would always script out his matches, often faxing big show matches move for move to his opponents before shows, or working them out with Atlanta-based wrestlers at the power plant. The mark of a good worker was to go in the ring with little worked out except a finish and a time frame, and do their magic impromptu, based on crowd reactions. When he did get over as a major star during the WCW boom period, it was always said he was pushed way above his true level of capabilities due to him being a neighbor and best friend with Bischoff. On the other hand, he spent 24 hours a day on his job, attempting to come up with his own angles, and made some high-powered friends most notable career-wise ending up being Carl Malone, which led to him headlining the second biggest pay-per-view gross in the history of the promotion and among the largest non-WrestleMania shows in history. This was in contrast to many of the veterans in the company, who were famous for wanting to do as little as possible and still collect their checks. He annoyed some, when they knew things were going down, as he usually tried, at least outwardly, to remain positive about the future in the face of all logic. He studied matches and videos and became a student, in particular, of what made legends like Jake Roberts and Terry Funk tick. It was hilarious in the early 90s during his first push, as his matches were largely spots and mannerisms copied either from Funk physically, or Roberts mentally. The Diamond Cutter, the move he made famous, was a takeoff O the Ace Crusher, the finisher Johnny Ace was using at the time in all Japan. He built everything in his match and his interviews around the pop of his sudden finishing spot, exactly how Roberts used to work an entire match around the DDT, but knew how to do it to where it always got an explosion when he got there. It was the same psychology, although not the same type of move, which led to the popularity of the Stone Cold Stunner, another quick movement that everyone knew was the climax of the match. 
What was amazing is that Page never had a serious program until he was nearly 39 years old. And that was almost a rib in itself, and hardly a way to start a march to the top. He was put in the ring with one of the clumsiest wrestlers around, a former college football player named Bill Dannenhauser, who used ring names like Dave and Evad Sullivan, after formerly being known as the Equalizer. The idea, because he looked like Kevin Sullivan, only much larger, was that he was the slow huge brother that the more manipulative and devious Kevin always picked on. In attempting to reprise the Randy Savage George Steele program that was actually the program that put Savage and Elizabeth on the map, he used his wife, Kimberly, in a role where the slow witted Sullivan had a crash on and feuded over, including Sullivan putting up his pet rabbit against Kimberly. Page had improved greatly over the previous year in the ring, but not enough to carry Sullivan. A first title win, the TV title over Renegade of September 17, 1995, was similar. Renegade was brought in by WCW when Hulk Hogan couldn't get Jim Helwig to agree to come to terms as his tag team partner. Instead, they brought in a smaller lookalike, with the same sounding ring music and costuming, and were going to call him the Renegade Warrior and attempt to fool the rubes that it was the same guy. Well, they figured they could at least long enough to steal one by rate. Between threats of lawsuits from WWF, they changed the character enough that people recognized he wasn't, and once the 30-second squash matches were over, it became evident the guy didn't have it. He was already on the downward slide, as in a TV title match against Paul Orndorff, a heel, in Huntington Beach, the fans booed Renegade. The TV title wasn't a big deal, and Page was just given the belt to get it off Renegade, and on to WCW's homegrown charismatic star, Johnny B. Bad, a little Richard knockoff who later became more famous as Sable's husband. A several-month program carefully orchestrated by Page put both of their careers on HEMAP. Bad, like Page, wasn't good at impromptu working, and was not a favorite of the veterans, but was charismatic enough that he was getting good fan reaction as a babyface. He was also a good athlete and a former state amateur boxing champion, with a good physique, who could do great moves. The two would lay out move for move, lengthy scripts to their matches. Page would build matches up, ending with one near fall after another, like they did in Japan and like Ric Flair would do. While many of the veterans mocked Page behind his back at the idea of actually scripting a match, which is funny because nobody did when Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat did the same thing for their famed WrestleMania 3 match, and for guys using a fax machine to transport it, the feud was a breakthrough for both men. Mero won most improved in the Observer Awards in 1995, while Page placed fourth. Page got a similar award from Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Page was very close to the decision makers at the magazine, like he was to Bischoff, and while a star, many noted that when seeing that he ranked in their mythical top ten three times, placed third for Wrestler of the Year in 1998 and won Best Villain in 1999. Off these matches, Mero became so respected as a young star and a potential main eventer, that he was the subject of a bidding war, and went to the WWF and was giving the company's first major downside guarantee in years, in order to steal him from WCW. It was while wooing him that Vince McMahon met his wife. Marrow, after getting a big early push, including the IC title, was considered a flop in WWF because of his inability to put a match together in the ring. He gained a reputation for not knowing how to work, and his career ended. That was actually very similar to what happened with Page five years later when he went to WWF. While their methods were mocked, the bottom line was, they were having good matches and fans were getting into both of them. Page created some elaborate angles. Some were too silly that most in wrestling, rightly so, felt were real bad. There was the one where he won $13 million in Vegas. There was the one where Bad beat Page to win the services of Kimberly, who Page was mistreating, to be his manager. She'd help Bad continually upend Page to win and retain the TV title. It was built up for a match on March 10, 1996 at the uncensored pay-per-view in Tupelo, Mississippi, where if Page lost, he'd retire. If Bad lost, Page would not only get the TV title back, but Kimberly would come back as well. But it never quite happened. Marrow's contract was expiring. Marrow's wife, then just another striking blonde with oversized implants known as Rena, complained loudly about Marrow being on television appearing as if he was with Kimberly. Marrow and his wife publicly talked about their religious faith, saying they felt it looked bad for her daughter in school to have her friends eat it on television. That turned into one of life's great ironies when Rena became Sable, and all the twists and turns of her managing various people, Marrow turning on her, and her constantly stripping to less and less clothing after first being known in wrestling as the person whose religious beliefs wouldn't allow her husband to do the angle with Kimberly.
with Mero making noises of leaving, they rushed the TV title to Lex Luger. Mero never even made the pay-per-view, which was changed at the last taping to a new program, where Hulk Hogan's buddy, Ed Leslie, who couldn't use the name Brutus Beefcake, or even Brother Brutie due to WWF Legal, became the booty man. Kimberly became his booty babe. Page was back in a feud with a guy who couldn't wrestle to save his life. Since it was a new gimmick for Leslie, the decision was made he couldn't lose, even with a retirement stipulation. So Page lost, and had to retire. Fake retirements were not done that often in wrestling then, but even so, nobody believed it. Nor should they have. Page's new angle was he was a man who was down and out. He explained all those millions of the previous angle weren't really won in Vegas, but were Kimberly's money. There was supposed to be a mysterious benefactor who would bring Page back to wrestling, but like many angles in wrestling, that was teased for months, then dropped before a conclusion. He returned on WCW's next pay-per-view, on May 19, 1996 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, winning a battle royal to earn a world title shot at the Great American Bash. But by the time that show rolled around, plans were changed again. Lex Luger, a bigger draw, was put in the title match. Page instead beat Marcus Bagwell in the second match of the show. He floundered until a program with A. Guerrero which included a match for the vacant U.S. title. Ric Flair tore his rotator cuff and needed surgery. Page had strong matches with Guerrero and earned the Observer's Most Improved Wrestler Award at the age of 40. Something totally unprecedented, Vader later won the award past the age of 40, but that was more of a comeback award than an improvement at that age. He was one of a few undercard guys truly elevated to the top in WCW, a fact many credit more to his friends as to his improving ring ability. On April 6, 1997, one day after his 41st birthday, he was added to the true main event mix when he pinned Randy Savage to start a program at Spring Stampede in Tupelo, Mississippi. It was a feud started when Savage made remarks about Kimberly's Playboy spread. He worked at or near the top for the rest of the year, as WCW overtook WWF, as the main promotion in the world. His second ascension came when Nash and Hall, who were selling for nobody, allowed him, I guess due to him being with them in their early days, to come in and lay both of them out with his diamond cutter after he turned down their invitation to join the NWO. He remained a top star through the ups and downs of WCW over the next four years. Without question, his biggest match in many ways was among his worst. Page had met Carl Malone at a Utah Jazz basketball game. Malone, a big wrestling fan, gave him the diamond cutter sign. Dennis Rodman, Malone's rival on the courts, had already flirted with wrestling on a couple of prior pay-per-view shows aligning himself with Hulk Hogan that did strong buy rates. Bischoff and Page were able to put together the tag match with Page and Malone versus Hogan and Rodman. As luck would have it, the Chicago Bulls and the Jazz went to the NBA championship, and Malone and Rodman tumbled to the floor in a spot that gained tons of publicity with Bob Costas even commenting about it being hype for their match on July 12, 1998 at the Cox Arena in San Diego. In what was the most publicized mainstream pro wrestling match with the exception of a few of the biggest WrestleManias, Hogan and Rodman beat Page and Malone in 23-47 in among the worst matches of that year when Ed Leslie hit Page with, what else, a stone-cold stunner. The show drew 600,000 buys on pay-per-view, one of the largest figures up to that point in time in wrestling history and the second largest WCW would ever do. When the match was later shown on television, it drew a 7.1 rating going head up against Raw. The success caused the company to do what wrestling always does, take a good concept and run it into the ground. The next month it was Jay Leno who worked with Page in a tag match beating Hogan and Bischoff. Fans were into the curiosity of Rodman and Malone, two huge superstar athletes, and it was a novelty. The Leno thing came too fast, and the public didn't see Leno as a physical threat so in spite of tons of media publicity for the event, the buy rate was far lower. Page had a mixed reputation in WCW. Everyone had their opinion. He befriended almost all the power plant guys when he was a somebody and they were nobodies. Others saw him as a great self-promoter, with many using the Bruce Mitchell-created nickname of D.D. Me, which his wife even used in a later angle when she turned heel on him and went with Bischoff. Taking a name from James Brown, he nicknamed himself the hardest working man in show business, no doubt he worked very hard. At his age, with his body constantly banged up and carrying about 255 pounds, he was doing dives out of the ring, bumping like crazy and doing anything it would take to have great matches on pay-per-view. More often than not, he succeeded. Still, a lot of wrestlers felt they worked just as hard as he did, and resented his friendship with Bischoff that gave him preferential treatment, particularly with the announcer's praise.
In 1997, after a Halloween Havoc show where Rey Mysterio Jr. and Eddie Guerrero had perhaps the best singles match in the recent history of the promotion, the next day, on TV, the announcers were instead raving about the match Page had with Savage. A year later, when Page carried Bill Goldberg to what was one of the three best matches of Goldberg's career, Page had it sold on television as if it ranked among the great matches in history. When he won the WCW heavyweight title on April 11, 1999 in a four-way over champ Ric Flair, Sting and Hogan in Tacoma, many point to it as the beginning of the end or the title. With the exception of the giant who was a freak, every wrestler who held the title had a long-standing reputation, a major star. No doubt Page had been a major star for a couple of years and had good matches under his belt, he was not a draw and few, except perhaps Bischoff, saw him as world championship material. Then, in a desperate attempt to garner TV ratings, he both lost and regained the title to Sting on a Nitro in Fargo, North Dakota. WCW thought it was a brilliant idea because no major world title had ever changed hands twice on the same television show. What they failed to realize is that there was a reason for that, and it didn't have anything to do with the predecessors in the industry not being able to come up with such an idea. Ricky Steamboat, who was a headliner for decades and one of the five best in-ring workers in the U.S. of his era, only held the title once during his career. While retired, and only watching casually by this point, he turned on the TV and saw Page with the same belt that he wore ten years earlier. He remarked at that point he knew the company was going down. A look at Page's title history in WCW in 1999 and 2000 is a capsule on how to destroy a company. He won the title for one day from Jeff Jarrett as part of a booking philosophy of weekly title changes. The idea was that title changes meant ratings, but instead, only served to devalue them and ratings declined. He never lost it in the ring. It went to the winner of a fall in a tag match, to actor David Arquette. The booking team thought it was so clever, and they even got mainstream publicity. This led to the lowest rated for a Nitro in years. His tag title reigns tell the same story. He teamed with Bam Bam Bigelow to win the title from a team that didn't have it. He lost the title in a match he wasn't involved in. He won the title clean, but a heel commissioner took it from him anyway. He wrote his biography, Positively Page, coming on the heels of number one bestsellers by Rock and Mick Foley. Even with an angle pushing it on TV, with heel Chris Canyon's mock book Positively Canyon used as a foreign object, it didn't sell well. A feud where Canyon dressed up as Page while Page was out of action, only to return, and have the two never feud with each other, was more WCW insanity. Another time he had a hot program based on a work shoot with Buff Bagwell over Kimberly, where they did a fake fight in front of the wrestlers to try and make people believe it was real after Brian Pillman changed the mindset off many in wrestling. After some strong personal interviews, the two popped a 3.9 rating for their match, a number far better than WCW had been doing for just about anything. For reasons nobody could explain, the feud was stopped almost immediately. Discipline was totally out of control as WCW became the uncontrollable snowball running downhill. Scott Steiner, who had done unscripted interviews having nothing to do with planned storylines on live television before, did a promo on Page, largely due to Kimberly's complaints about Steiner calling her names, which resulted in Kimberly quitting and Steiner not being punished. Page was in a tough position as he went to confront Steiner and started a backstage fight over the promo. The fight was short, brutal and very one-sided, obviously not in Page's favor. And then WCW was history. The good news was with Bischoff in charge, Page had signed a low seven-figure annual contract that had about a year left. That alone tells just how ridiculous things had gotten. Not that Page wasn't a top star, but seven-figure guaranteed deals in wrestling are limited to people with sizable drawing power. Flair, the company's all-time legend and still its biggest ratings draw when he was a face, was only earning $800,000. There was no way, when WCW went down, that WWF was going to absorb that contract. But Page's goal from day one of his career was to get to the federation he watched on television as a kid growing up in New Jersey. He'd been almost everywhere by this time, but the only brief fling he had with the WWF was driving his pink Cadillac at a WrestleMania to escort Honky Tonk Man to the ring. Timing worked in his favor, or so it seemed. Vince McMahon had come up with an angle where Steve Austin would turn out to be the man stalking Undertaker's wife Sarah, to build for a match on June 24, 2001 at the King of the Ring. However, with ratings plummeting, Paul Heyman managed to convince Vince McMahon to go another direction. Out of nowhere, he had Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho beat Triple H and Austin in a tag match in San Jose, California where Jericho would pin Austin to set up a title match, taking Austin out of the picture with Undertaker. 
instead, Page would be the stalker. Page gave up much of his $1.3 million or so in guaranteed money, getting maybe half of it in a buyout, to sign for a tiny in comparison downside guarantee, and start out on top in WWF in a feud with Undertaker. He walked in as the first major WCW invader to show his face on Raw in a program with a top guy, doing an interview on Raw revealing himself, to set up a street fight at King of the Ring. His career went downhill fast. As the first major shot in the WWF versus WCW war, there was only one thing that could possibly happen. Page, with help from other WCW cohorts, needed to destroy Undertaker and have a brutal stretcher job to start the war. Instead, Page, whose track record for good matches in WCW suddenly meant nothing, had to pay his dues. Undertaker sold little. Page's role was to bump for him almost the entire confrontation, and then run away. The summer of stupidity had begun. Even though Page was part of the WCW and ECW team that beat the WWF team at the Invasion pay-per-view, which ended up legitimately drawing 726,400 buys the most successful WWF pay-per-view in history that wasn't called WrestleMania, his career was about to become toast. He was mocked for not being able to work. Somehow a good scripted match was now less entertaining to fans than a bad match called in the ring by a WWF headliner. His track record was in a different style, so be wrestling a slightly different style, it confirmed he didn't know how to work. The Undertaker program culminated in his being pinned in a match by Sarah Calloway. There were constant rumors he was about to get canned. At one agent's meeting, McMahon even told the agents not to worry about the headache Page was causing because he wouldn't be around much longer. After being spoiled in WCW, where Bischoff would listen to him and he had star status, since he was no longer a star, his opinions were now a nuisance and he was driving people crazy. His career was over, until he saw a commercial for a TV show called Bob Patterson about a self-help guru. Page had always wanted to be a motivational speaker after wrestling, learning from his own experience to being a late starter in wrestling and being part of some big money programs, as well as his overcoming dyslexia and learning to read at late age. The powers that be loved his ideas for Positively Page, and from his experience in WCW with catchphrases, Feel the Bang, and Hollywood Scum. Hogan, he delivered the most over catchphrase in WWF history for a guy whose character wasn't the slightest bit over. His career wound down to, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Most of his vignettes were terrible, with the exception of one with Stephanie McMahon's secretary that caused the live crowd to give him a huge ovation. Pretty soon his goofy smile was relegated to a prelim feud with Christian, more designed to get Christian over. The TV show he patterned his character after was the biggest flop of the fall season, and ended abruptly. His career didn't last much longer. He went into the ring on April 16, 2002 in Houston, asked to put Bob Holly over. From all accounts, he wasn't particularly thrilled. He did, but in doing so, had his neck messed up first by a hard clothesline, and probably worse taking a bad bump and landing badly on his neck from a superplex. He had an auspicious beginning, thrown into a battle royal as a manager with no experience as a wrestler, and an ending in a match that was supposed to be forgotten the minute it ended. It was the time in between that made for one of this generation's most fascinating stars. This is the end of this conversion. Be sure to comment and subscribe. See you next time.